but this is not too much of an imposition, this uh, change of time and later in the day. Um, so so we'll, we'll agree to meet it, start at 5.15 and uh, 5.15 to 6. And perhaps I should say a couple of words about uh, syllabus, such as it is. Um, um, So the whole course is called an introduction to the Langlands program. So uh, let's let's. Uh, this is just I've made this sort of informal. But uh, what we're talk, what we're doing now, and uh, what we'll do probably for another few couple of lectures, uh, is an introduction to the course. So I'm talking about the Langlands program in very general terms. Hopefully, terms that motivate it and make it seem plausible, the kind of problems that would be one would investigate. Um, okay, uh, let's say two. Um, so, some of the things here I'm going to allude to, maybe even starting today, but I would want to talk about them in more detail, although not uh, with all of the precise definitions and so on. So uh, I would say further details. On automorphic representations. And um, uh, the, the big conjecture in the Langlands program, somehow the conjecture on which everything else hangs, at least uh, it was that way until maybe 20 years ago when he added a second conjecture that was sort of a partner of this. But the big conjecture, the one that wasn't named this, didn't get acquire this name in 1969 when he wrote his original paper, what came considerably later, but functoriality. Um, uh, what else? So maybe uh, section uh, three. Uh, so uh, this again is topics. It would be expanding on topics that are in Langland's original article. And uh, this would be vague groups, what are called vague groups, um, local L functions. and epsilon factors. So uh, these are quite elaborate, especially epsilon factors. I'm not going to be going through uh, the theory of this. I, I'm just going to say what role they play. Um, so epsilon factors. Um, uh, what's known as the local Langlands correspondence. It's a conjecture. It's a conjecture that, in fact, was proposed in rather general terms in his original article, but it has a broader meaning now. The local Langlands classification. It's a conjecture. A conjecture that um, seems to be uh, close to being resolved, at least in many cases, by uh, Peter Schulze. He's another person that is writing, he belongs to a third group of people that, is write, that are writing big papers these days. Um, so the local Langlands classification and uh, a very closely related thing, local functoriality. Um, the fourth one, let's, let's call that, we'll see how this goes but uh, um, global, more on global, I mean, we're talking about it uh, here, but global functoriality. And I'm thinking about it in the context of the local things we would be talking about there. Um, um, and in particular, what's, uh, Vague groups are very interesting, locally compact groups. They're a little bit bigger than Galois groups. Um, they were introduced by Vey. We'll, we'll talk about why, they, why, he, uh, why he did it, a very natural reason for doing it. Um, they're locally compact groups, and they are things which play the role 
in Langland's theory of classifying conjecturally uh, the representations of the local groups. That is to say, the representations of real algebraic groups, of um, uh, p-adic algebraic groups. And I'm talking about representations in the sense of analysis, infinite dimensional unitary representations. Um, but there are the pieces that then go into automorphic representations and uh, global uh, uh, questions. Um, so we'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, global functoriality. Um, and uh, the thing is, so we'll, we'll, we'll come to this. I hope we have time to do it. Um, these vague groups are remarkable things. Um, there's a global vague group as well as a local vague group but it's not good enough, it's too small. And Langlands proposed in 1977, the existence of a bigger group uh, locally. Well, it was Kotwitz that pointed out it should be described as a, local, as, as a locally compact group. And um, so this would be uh, the construction of this larger group. Uh, the, this would be the global um, Langlands group. Very uh, interesting and complex, uh, locally compact uh, group, non-abelian, um, that uh, um, would play the role in the classification of automorphic representations and a closely related group. Uh, I don't know how far we'll get to this, um, and uh, what's known as the motivic Galois group. So there's a conjecture as to what this should look like. I actually I, I described it about 20 years ago, and I put it in a I put it in and just in the bulletin didn't make much noise about it because I wanted to be able to think about it before people uh, I thought it was yeah I thought it was right and I thought it was a good thing to work on and I put it uh, in a well, I put it in the bulletin uh, for the conference on Robert Moody's in his honor and they were publishing it in the bulletin so I conjectured what this would be and in fact what this would be at least regarded as a group over the complex numbers motivic Galois group this this and this would be closely related. So I hope the conjecture is almost right. Uh, it, it's relatively, in some sense, it's rather simple, um, but it remains to be seen um, how, whether it's, whether, how much it needs to be adjusted uh, to, to be completely correct. Uh, but in any case, it's very closely related to uh, global functoriality, and it's very closely related uh, it's believed, it's proof, uh, it would be closely related to the proof of functoriality, which I believe, and Langlands believe, um, should come from what's known as the trace formula. So this is a, a, a very uh, complex formula, but it seems to supply the power to be able to prove very difficult analytic facts, which don't seem to be um, uh, ha provable by other means. Uh, so the trace formula, and, and I would just ha only have time to talk about the simplest version of the trace formula, trace formula for compact quotient. Other people, this there's a very precise, um, um, conjectural way to use this trace formula to at least try to apply it to the proof of these things here it was proposed by Langlands uh, again around the turn well around the turn of the 20th century and it's known as beyond endoscopy and I it would be very nice to be able to say something about that but I don't know whether um, uh, the rate I'm going I probably won't be able to say too much about it but in any case, and now Secularidis has other ideas. He thinks you should use something called the relative trace formula and go and, uh, go and uh, others uh, feel that you should use something else again. 
um, uh, work of that began with um, uh, Kajdan and Braverman um, on L functions, just studying L functions. So there is there's a divergence of opinion on the best way to try to um, attack functoriality, but it is really one of the major problems, the major, well, let's say one of the major problems in this business, and uh, uh, there's different ideas on how best to go about proving it. Whatever it is, it's going to be difficult. All right, so we'll put that back up there. Um, ooh. Um, so what we did, I just recall that, um, oh, thank you. So Galois theory, we, we, I just recall what we said about Galois theory. Um, um, well, let, let me just say something very simple, which we've already talked about in the case of the symmetric group, there exists a bijection uh, to, between partitions of N. And this is where you don't um, order the partitions. They can be in any, the, the, the numbers can be in any order that you want. Uh, and that's bijective with conjugacy classes in the symmetric group. And uh, so I mentioned uh, that uh, in particular, if you have, you have an equation and you solve it by uh, some means or other, uh, that the conjugacy classes in the splitting field of that equation, um, if it ha the splitting field happens to have Galois group, the full symmetric group, and the conjugacy classes in the splitting field, um, the unramified conjugacy classes, throwing away a finite number of them, um, are bijective with partitions of n. Um, but then I stated a, a fact that comes from number theory, uh, and we're just going to accept this, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, talk, talking about uh, splitting fields of, of equation integral uh, polynomial equations in one variable is fine. Uh, it's it's where Galois got all of his ideas, but it's not really the way. It's just for motivation for describing these things. It's not the way to really uh, formulate them. The fact that you one wants to use is this sort of refinement, which comes from algebraic number theory. So this is, I, I said all this, but this is uh, just a review that the map which sends P to FP, FP is, is simply, simply the definition of this map, it's called the Frobenius conjugacy class, is a well-defined map um, map from um, the uh, Galois group Um, so this is if, um, this is if gamma F, um, is a Galois group for this a splitting field, which is not necessarily, uh, in SN is well defined. Uh, and so this is a map from not from primes P not in a finite set that we throw away right at the beginning of the process, um, the so-called ramified primes, and it's a map from this almost all primes to um, um, conjugacy classes in the Galois group. So this is the Galois group of the splitting field of F over Q. Um, so it's well defined and it in fact doesn't depend on F. It depends and is independent of F. There are many different there are many different polynomials whose splitting fields will give the same uh, Galois group. 
in fact, two splitting fields are the same fields. So, I mean, if that weren't true, one could sort of argue, well, what's the need for class field theory? We just take polynomials and we factor them, and that's what gives Galois um, extensions. The thing is that many different apps give the same uh, splitting field, and um, what we seek is some independent characterization of this correspondence. In particular, what sets of primes, uh, can you say anything explicit about what sets of primes correspond to what conjugacy classes? And so this, uh, this becomes more um, uh, interesting. So this becomes more interesting with the following definition. Um, so one says that if you have a field, I'll just, I'll just say, forget about the polynomial, Galois field, um, um, and um, one says that then um, uh, uh, well, I'll, so I'll let, let's I'll still attach it to a polynomial, say, but um, um, one would say obviously that F splits completely. over p. Um, maybe I could, uh, for a given p, we could send this to the partition pi p. Um, so we would say that f splits completely if it breaks into linear, for if f of x breaks in the linear factors. mod p. Obviously, I guess that's, uh, so in other words, i.e. the Frobenius conjugacy class, um, that's the conjugacy class that um, for almost any prime uh, is uh, given in a um, well-defined way inside the Galois group of a, a given extension, a Galois group of an extension that doesn't depend on a given polynomial f. Um, i.e. the Frobenius conjugacy class is the identity element in the Galois group f over q. And that is particularly interesting because um, uh, you, I think one of you mentioned this last time, uh, there is a theorem, so we're looking at, we, we want some independent way of trying to uh, characterize Galois extensions. And we don't even know what quite what question to ask to, at this stage. Yes, pardon me? Um, the Galois group, well, I, I'm, I suppose I've got too many Fs here. Um, uh, oh, E, I'm calling it E, aren't I? Yes, E. So I'll call it EF. Yeah, sorry, we'll call it E, so EF. Okay, but at least we have the following very striking theorem that comes from um, number theory, I guess algebraic number theory. It's, it's a very simple consequence of abelian class field theory, which we haven't talked about in detail. But I think it's more elementary than that. I haven't never really gone through it. If if I were to write p of e, so okay, e over q is Galois. And uh, if I were to write p um, of e. For the set of primes, P, on ramified primes, so I'm throwing away a finite set of bad primes. The notion of unramified uh, is uh, totally independent of the notion we had for a polynomial, the, the factors of a polynomial. It, it comes from um, either uh, ideal, uh, uh, well, it comes from algebraic number theory. 
Um, so if P of E is a set of primes, um, uh, uh, um, so the set of primes such that the Frobenius conjugacy class, this conjugacy class is one, in other words, the set of primes that split completely, um, then the mapping Um, which sends Galois extensions E of Q, that mapping, which sends um, that to subsets of prime numbers. Okay, so you, we're interested in classifying number fields. We take finite Galois extensions of Q, and in those Galois extensions, we look at the set of primes in any given one of these Galois extensions, we look at the set of primes that split completely. Um, that's what I'm calling P of E here. Um, that this map, so just to just say from Galois extensions um, to subsets of primes, Galois extensions to, um, maybe I should say it like this, to subsets P of E of primes, the subsets of primes that split completely, that mapping is injective. In other words, the set of primes that split completely in a Galois extension, this is, this is a set of primes that split completely, that's just a collection of prime numbers. That's something right down, uh, you know, have to, to describe that set, you uh, don't really, it, it's given to you as a piece of data attached to the rational numbers, to rational primes. And so that set, um, um, let's put it, let's say that um, the subset Um, um, P of E of primes that split completely in a given Galois extension um, so that uh, over, over, let's say, over which um, E splits completely This, sub, this collection of data attached to the rational numbers, this subset of primes, um, um, characterizes E. Characterizes, the Galois, characterizes E as a Galois extension of the rational numbers. And I don't remember who it was that uh, pointed that, that talked that talked about it, but this uses class field theory. Believe it or not, it uses abelian class field theory. This theory that uh, is a big piece of what goes into the Langlands program. So um, abelian, I guess I should say. So abelian class field theory in the form of something you prove from that, um, namely what's called the Chebotarov um, density theorem. So I won't talk about that, but it's, it's a consequence of uh, um, it's simpler, but it can be regarded as an immediate consequence of abelian class field theory. So now the problem that we have posed can be formulated in quite graphic terms. Um, so this would be the big problem. Again, I'm talking in rather general terms. Uh, we're not going to get something that is very as 
is a simple, uh, you know, I'm making it seem very simple, but it's, it's, for me anyway, it's helpful to visualize what we're looking for. So the big problem, which I phrased earlier, um, can be given more, uh, uh, can be made more precise than the way we had it earlier. This is, this would be non-abelian class field theory. We want to classify not just the abelian extensions, which we'll, I'll, we'll talk about in greater detail a little bit later. Um, what, what is non-abelian class field theory? How, what do you write down to classify the abelian extensions of the rational numbers or more generally um, a number field? Um, as this would be non-abelian class field theory. What is its image? Okay, we've got a map here that's injective. Galois extensions and subsets of primes, PE. But it's a rather complicated subset of primes. Um, uh, we have to approach the problem is that we don't know anything about what subsets that you get. And so here's the problem of non-abelian class field theory. We could phrase it at least. What subsets, another weird way to say it is, what subsets um, of primes are of the form P of E for some Galois extension, finite Galois extension E over Q. Uh, whatever that is, it would give a classification of Galois extensions. This could serve as a classification of Galois extensions. E over Q. Well, um, I, this doesn't really um, uh, give us a solution to the problem. It's just formulating it in a way that's quite concise. Um, um, uh, there's lots of, uh, well, what, set, what, sets e, uh, what sets P of E of primes are of this form? We don't know, but it's definitely not everything. I mean, that, that's a very... Um, interest, they're very interesting subsets of prime numbers, and that the problem is to, in theoretical terms, uh, in motivational terms, the problem would be to try to write down what they are. And if you could do that, then you'd start looking at the subsets of primes to maybe deduce properties of the corresponding Galois extension. Any questions? Yes, Ali. Yes, it does. It does. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Um, I won't try to write it down now, but uh, it's it's they're given by congruence conditions. Well, we we actually did solve this problem. We wrote down the solution to this problem for the Gaussian field. Uh, it was a set of primes which were congruent to one mod four. Um, uh, sadly, it's not that well. I won't say sadly. It's uh, let's. It's happy. You know, it's, it's rich, the mathematics is richer. It's it's um, you don't get anything like as simple as what happens in the Gaussian integers, or really for any abelian extension. There, the, the 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 solution for abelian class field theory really is given in, in more elaborate ways by congruence conditions. And uh, yes? So are the extensions we're going to here abelian or are these are just any arbitrary Galois? These are arbitrary Galois extensions. Okay. So the abelian ones are included in this. And so the answer to this question, if you restrict yourself to abelian extensions, is known. Um, 
it's the, the construction of the corresponding sets of primes. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it um, a little bit later. Um, it's primes that are a little bit like the ones that are congruent to mod four for the Gaussian integers, but they're more elaborate, but it's still given by congruence conditions. It gets more interesting, but uh, still way, way simpler than um, what you would for non-abelian extensions. Uh, abelian class field theory is already deep and interesting for Q, Galois, Galois extensions of Q that are abelian, but it's considerably deeper for Galois extensions of F, a number field that are abelian. If uh, you, you, you might say that um, if you're only talking about abelian extensions, then you probably then you probably want to know uh, what the abelian extensions are of any number field. If you're talking about all Galois extensions, I, I guess that includes everything. But if you're talking about abelian ones, you, you'd probably want to know what all the abelian extensions of a given number field are going to be. And a, a abelian class field theory tells you that uh, if it's a more general number field, it's in terms of ideals rather than primes. But uh, um, the, the thing is that the Langlands conjecture uh, that we'll get to, we won't get to it today, but the Langlands proposed solution to this problem does fit in beautifully with abelian class field theory. Okay, so um, it's, uh, we can, maybe it's good for, um, I don't know the most efficient way to do this. Um, uh, uh, what, what do I, what do I do to, well, I'll, I'll just, something will be displayed if I do this. So, um, uh, for, uh, a, a slight digression is, um, it doesn't solve the problem of non-abelian class field theory at all, but it, um, sort of puts it in a slightly different um, context. Um, uh, I mentioned the person that put the cap on abelian class field theory that really settled this thing that people had been working on for decades was Emile Artin. And so, um, and he, he, he was interested in non-abelian extensions. Wasn't too much he could say about it, but um, he introduced what are now known as Artin L functions. And this is uh, uh, quite uh, relevant to what Langland ended up defining. Um, uh, Artin suggested that number fields should be, um, rather than thinking about for Frobenius, Frobenius conjugacy classes as just conjugacy classes within a Galois group, he said, well, look, they're more, um, they're gonna be more uh, concrete if you embed them in a larger group. And so what he did was he said, uh, suppose that you have a finite Galois extension. Um, so that's got a Galois group, finite, a finite group. And uh, so finite groups, people study those things, uh, they study the representations. So supposing that, in fact, I'm going to call it R, is a mapping from a finite group, a finite Galois group into GLNC, the, group, the uh, uh, general complex general linear group of n by n invertible matrices. So let's suppose uh, uh, is uh, a finite dimensional injective, let's say, uh, representation for uh, a Galois extension. Finite Galois extension E over Q. Um, Artin said, well, look, I mean, you've got conjugacy classes, <clears throat> excuse me, Con conjugacy classes in this finite group, 
if you map this finite group into the general linear group as a homomorphism, then finite conjugacy classes simply become semi-simple. They're, they're finite order. So they're going to become semi-simple conjugacy classes in the general linear group. Um, and so then for every prime number p, uh, again, we're going to throw away the ramified ones. Uh, and uh, at this point, since I don't have a polynomial, I'll just say for some finite set, uh, uh, constructed in a very natural way from the Galois extension by elementary algebraic number theory. So if you just have to throw away for some finite set of primes S, um, um, you get a semi-simple conjugacy class um, um, We agreed that for every P not in S, we have a conjugacy class in the Galois group, which we called the Frobenius conjugacy class. And so if I were to take R of F P, that will map into, it's not necessarily going to be injective, but I can, that's then a maps to a semi-simple conjugacy class in GLN. And if I'm taking conjugacy in GLN, that's um, more than just taking conjugacy in the finite group, but nonetheless, it maps to a, a, a semi-simple conjugacy class in GLNC. It's a finite order, but that's okay. We, who cares? That's still interesting. <clears throat> and how do you measure conjugacy classes? How do you measure finite? How do, how do you measure semi-simple conjugacy classes in the general linear group? Well, there's, of course, a natural way to parameterize them. You take the characteristic polynomial, and that completely determines the conjugacy class. Um, so I'll say determine um, by its characteristic polynomial. So Arton said, well, you know, that's, that's a good thing to do, actually. Um, uh, let's see. After a couple of months, I probably will figure out the most efficient way to turn these blackboards so that what I've written is visible for the longest amount of time. But, It'll be a while before I do. Um, so Arden said, let's make a definition. So um, um, we talked about the Riemann zeta function. Uh, after the Riemann zeta function, or together with the Riemann zeta function, there are Dirac-Clay L series. Uh, and then more and more general L functions were defined throughout class field theory. And all of the uh, premises of class field theory came with um, each of them had L functions attached to them. And Arden said, well, I don't know what non-abelian class field is going to be, but there's an L function attached to it. Um, there's going to be an L function attached to it. Uh, I will just define LP, the local um, factor of what would be my L function, I'll just take the characteristic polynomial of this Frobenius conjugacy class in GLN. And I won't, uh, the variable uh, would be not uh, X, uh, just a, num a number, but rather P to the S. And that way it'll match the definition. It, it would be exactly the analog of the definition of L functions, the Riemann zeta function or the Dirac-Clay L functions or more generally, the L functions that are attached to abelian extensions by class field theory. So what he did was he took its characteristic polynomial. This is not quite the characteristic polynomial. It's, uh, I'm going to put one as its constant term rather than the variable. And then I take the conjugacy class, RFP. And then the variable, um, 
is, uh, which would usually be x, but instead I take p to the minus s. And I also take minus one. So that looks like the Riemann zeta function. The Riemann zeta function uh, is an Euler product uh, uh, of polynomial power uh, of Euler product of uh, Taylor series in p to the minus s um, gotten by taking one over one minus p to the minus s. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're taking the determinant. Uh, we're taking the characteristic polynomial of this conjugacy class in gen the general linear group, a conjugacy class given to me by just a representation of the Galois group. And I'm taking uh, this characteristic polynomial evaluated at p, it's really the value, you really put the variable there, but it doesn't matter, evaluated at p to the minus s, and I'm taking its inverse. Whatever it is, it's going to be a power series um, in p to the minus s, this time with some more interesting coefficients. So this is, he defined this local L function, and then he said, well, we'll, we'll just make an Euler product out of these things. Uh, it'll be an Euler product that isn't quite as nice as that of the Riemann zeta function, because I'm leaving out the Archimedean places, the gamma functions that gave a nice functional equation. And I'm also leaving out um, the um, primes, the finite set of primes that are ramified. But the essence of it, is given by this the Euler product of these things the product over p not in s of lp s and r so it's an Euler product this is a power series in p to the minus s and uh, then i take the product over pri all primes of these power series and so you can put them together by choosing um, uh, and it's a power series that's leading coefficient is one. So uh, you can just then collect terms and you're going to get a, a, a Dirichlet series, a series in n to the minus s, but with interesting coefficients, not just coefficients one, like in the Riemann zeta function, but interesting coefficients that have to do uh, with these Frobenius conjugacy classes. So Arden must have been very pleased when he to find that it doesn't solve our problem at all, but it uh, it get it poses the, it puts the problem in a different way and a different way of looking at it that might be of interest analytically. Yes. Oh yes, yes. These this you you can all put those all in here. I'm not doing it. Yeah, yeah. You can put them all in there. Langland's. Uh, uh, and as well as the ones for the ramified primes, you can put them all in, and that's what you really should be doing. But um, um, uh, but uh, uh, did did Arjun? Yeah, he would have he would have put them in. He 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 would have put them in. Maybe not as elegantly or as completely as uh, arose later with Langlands, but he he put them in. Okay, so I want to, so uh, this is the Dirichlet series. With Euler product. This is called an Artin L function. And I think that this probably was towards the very end of his, um, I won't say his career, but the, the very end of all of his discoveries in abelian class field theory. And um, he, this was, I think, around 1935. Um, all right, and then he posed the following conjecture. Um, L of S, L upper S, I put an upper S to meaning I've, meaning I've left out the factors, finitely many factors that come from S. And as a matter of fact, the sort of understanding these days is you write S for a 
set of valuations, which include the ramified primes and the Archimedean primes. So it means that I've left out contributions from the Archimedean primes and the ramified primes. That's what the upper S means. Um, and so uh, L of S R um, has analytic continuation. Um, I hope I have this right. Uh, um, it has analytic continuation. Uh, basically, almost all the time, it's not just analytic continuation to a meromorphic function. Almost all the time, it's analytic continuation to an entire function. Basically, the obstruction to it being entire is if the representation R contains the trivial representation. Uh, but if R, let's say, is an irreducible representation of degree two or more, then uh, it will be, according to Artin's conjecture, entire. So it has analytic continuation to an entire function. Uh, if it could have a pole at S equals one, the way the Riemann zeta function does if it contains trivial one-dimensional representation. But in general, it would be to an entire function, let's say, almost always. Um, that um, uh, with a functional equation, that relates its values its uh, values at 1 uh, at s and 1 minus s and there's going to be it's not just the l function at s equals the l function of what, uh, 1 mi at 1, 1 minus s because we have left out these things but these these missing factors are to be regarded as much more elementary than the L function itself, and so they just make a more complicated um, functional equation in which you have some kind of gamma function sitting in front of the value at S and another kind of gamma function, for example, at the value of one minus S. Um, uh, and actually there's something else that it goes into it, uh, a sign. Um, which is called an epsilon factor. So, but I won't talk about that. It, it just, I'll just say it's, it's ready in its values at S and one minus S. Um, and uh, we'll say this, I don't think Arden conjectured this, but I think everybody believes it um, and uh, satisfies. So this is not part of the Langlands program. It's beyond the Langlands program, an analog. of the Riemann hypothesis. So um, now this is hard enough. This is hard enough. But the, the analog of the Riemann hypothesis would be, uh, uh, which would imply That um, uh, that pi of x uh, one. Uh, let's uh, I'll just say what you would get with this Riemann hypothesis that pi of x one, uh, if that's to be not that all not the set of primes less than or equal to x, but rather the set of primes less than or equal to x, such that they split completely. In other words, such that the Frobenius conjugacy class is one. So this is a subset of what we were calling the set of all primes less than or equal to x. And if you had the Riemann hypothesis for these Arden L functions, you would be able to say that 
uh, you get a similar very, very striking uh, estimate. Um, this is supposed to be little pi, by the way. It's not a partition, it's the sets of primes. And so this would give uh, um, that pi of x um, one is, if I were to subtract from that, one over the order of the Galois group. Gamma E is the Galois group, so it's a finite group. You take one over the order of that, not just at the integral logarithm, but one over the order of that, and you multiply that by L of X, Li of X, that would be have the same very strong estimate, some, some explicitly given constant, CE, times X, uh, this, different, this, this is like of the order of x, and uh, what's left, it would be like one half plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. So I'm sure Arden would have thought, would have thought that. I don't recall him actually stating it, but uh, um, that's beyond the Langlands program. But what is really interesting, Arden did put, cobble together a kind of analytic continuation and functional equation for these L functions by basically using abelian class field theory and something called the Brouwer induction theorem. And it, there it was, well, one doesn't want to denigrate it, but it doesn't do, uh, it, it doesn't say anything about why this function is entire. Um, it, it, it's perhaps not clear why why that should be the case, but um, w the way it remain Arden's conjecture remains now is that Ar Arden did prove analytic continuation and functional equation, but uh, the the natural way to do it, which was well beyond Arden and is still well beyond us today in most cases, um, we'll describe how how that should go. Um, uh, would give it as an entire function. Um, okay, so that's that's a little digression, but now we uh, want to see what the Langlands program says about these non these Galois extensions, and in particular about L functions that include Arden's L functions. This doesn't give you, this is not a solution to the problem. It just wraps up the unknown data into another form, into the L function. It doesn't give an independent characterization of these primes that split completely. Questions? Now, I don't want to walk off with the, uh, I could, this would be good on the subway.